Grace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to the Village Church's online worship service on this 11th day in October 2020. Might you and your loved ones be blessed as we gather for worship as a virtual community. You are welcome to join us on site for Sunday worship at 10 a.m. at the church patio. It is uh, limited seating and we observe uh, wearing masks and physical distancing. And so if you'd like to join us on Sunday morning at 10 a.m., please RSVP with Holly Crawford. Right behind me is a very beautiful flower arrangement donated uh, by Alan and Hannah Goodman. They're at Lacoste Glen in honor and in memory of their late spouses, Corinne Goodman and John Shook. Thank you, Alan and Hannah. Remember, for those of you who have school-age kids, age kindergarten through sixth grade, our Kids Village ministry is, uh, began last Sunday, uh, Sunday school at the basketball courts at the church. And so if you would like to uh, bring your child or children, your, your grandchildren, nieces or nephew, again, kindergarten through sixth grade, please be in touch with Chelsea Atkins or Allison Noon. They gather at 9.45 a.m. for check-in and then begin at 10 o'clock on Sundays until about 10.45. Please continue to uh, support the uh, church's ministries through the giving of your contributions, tithes, and offerings on the Village Church website, villagechurch.org, or mailing in your contributions to the church at Box 704, Rancho Santa Fe, 92067. If you would like uh, support as you grieve or if you have lost someone or would like to uh, support others in their in their grieving, uh, do join our Journey Through Grief group that starts on October 14, facilitated by Wendy McClave Elliott, a member of the church. Reserve your spot by contacting Wendy or be in touch with uh, Pastor Jam. Our next blood drive is Sunday, the 18th of October, 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. And so please help to replenish our uh, region's blood supply and the contact is going to be flashed on your screen or be in touch with Pastor Jam. Our uh, drama ministry, headed by our director, Twyla Arant, is uh, hosting an um, online training for those interested in being a lay reader, to be a part of our lay, our lay reader ministry. You'll notice that in our online worship, we have uh, various members of the church who have been specially trained to serve as lay readers. And so if you're interested in joining that, please be in touch with Twyla. We are preparing our special Advent devotional again this year. It's hard to believe that the Advent season is fast approaching. And so if you would like to submit a brief article, a prayer, a piece of artwork, this is a collaborative event for members of the church community to participate. Please be in touch with Laura Metzger and her contact info is flashed on the screen. Our stewardship campaign um, to support the church's ministry moving forward is titled Harvest of Hope. This is an annual opportunity for members of the church and friends of the village church to participate and to indicate your pledge commitment for the upcoming year. And here to share more about the upcoming stewardship campaign is Pastor Jack. Well, howdy. Welcome to the Baca Farm. You know, the other day I was reading the good book and I came across a passage from the Psalms that I want to share with you. It's from Psalm 65. You crown the year with a bountiful harvest. Even the hard pathways overflow with abundance. You know, as a farmer, I like that psalm for one reason. It talks about a bountiful harvest. But there's another part of it that's kind of confusing, that part about the hard pathways overflowing with abundance. That just doesn't make any sense, does it? When you plant your seeds in the fertile soil, they'll grow and produce. But when you plant on hard ground, that doesn't happen so much. So I had to think about it a little bit. What's really going on in that psalm is that we're talking about the Lord and about how the Lord with his power and his creativity can make even wonderful things happen when seeds fall on hard ground. That passage is about the fact that sometimes when life is troubled and life is hard, even then God can bless us. And I like that fact. 
This is the season of harvest when we're celebrating all the bountiful gifts that the Lord has given us. It's also the season when in our church, the village church, we celebrate the bounty that the Lord gives us and then we make plans to share that with other folks. Our stewardship and generosity folks wanted me to share that passage with you and also to share that in the next couple of days, you're going to be getting a letter from me as well as a brochure that explains all the ministries going on in the life of our church and all the ways that we are blessing other people through the things that God has given us to do. I'd like you to read that letter and I'd like you to pray real hard about how you will plan your faithful financial giving for the coming year. There's also a special gift for you in that mailing. It's a package of seeds. We'd like you to plant these seeds right now. And then as they start to grow and flourish, send us photos, send us pictures of what you're seeing as God blesses you with abundance. I'll be praying for you and praying for all of us that God will continue to bless us in the hard times as well as the good times of life. See you later. Thank you, Pastor Jack, for sharing that word about our upcoming stewardship drive. As we have come together in worship, let us offer our hearts, our minds, our lives to the Lord. And let us prepare our hearts for worship through these words from Holy Scripture from Psalm 136. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His steadfast love endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the God of gods, for His steadfast love endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords, for His steadfast love endures forever. Who alone does great wonders, for His steadfast love endures forever. Who by understanding made the heavens, for His steadfast love endures forever. Friends, sisters, and brothers in Christ, let us worship the living God.
we pray together each week for forgiveness? Well, the simple answer is that we continue to sin. And we need both individually and as a community of faith to confess our sins so that we might experience the divine love of God given to us through his son, Jesus. God invites us to confess our sins and to be assured of forgiveness. Will you join me in prayer? Holy God, creator of all that is, donor of grace and giver of life, hear our prayer. There are chasms in our lives, deep valleys that separate us from one another and from you. We confess that we have allowed those rifts to grow for fear of admitting our part in the separation, for fear of being rejected when we reach out. You call us to be a reconciled life, to heal relationships, to a wholeness with each other and with you. Mend us, we pray, and make us new creations through the power and love of Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. Because of God's love for us, we are forgiven through his son, Jesus Christ. We are a new creation. The old is past, behold the new. Live in the newness of Christ. Amen. Now may the peace of Christ be with you. Take a moment, share that peace with other people, and then throughout the week, wherever you are, share the peace of Christ. Amen. When our home is hard to find And our faith is in decline We need a cause to stand behind Love, Love one another We all want the way it feels Time it comes and time it steals what remains, what is real? Love. love one another. There is love, there is forgiveness. There is love in times of need. When life is cold, there is There is love, love one There is love, love one It heals the sick, comforts the weak, breaks the proud, raises the meek. In this life, no guarantees, but there is love.
When life is cold, there is a promise. You will never go without. There is love. There is forgiveness. There is love in times of need. When life is cold, there is a promise. You will never go Good morning, Kids Village, and welcome to another Kids Message. For this morning, I wanted to start by saying that we had so much fun with all of you who were able to join us on the basketball court for Sunday school last week. It's been such a joy to be able to see you in person. We got to watch our video, make a craft, and do an activity, and we just loved being able to be together. For those of you who are joining us online, we hope that you're enjoying all of your Sunday school videos as well. This morning, your verse talks about how we need to have integrity with God, and we do that by asking for forgiveness in the moments that we fail. Now for our verse this morning, I have a little example for you all. I have these pink shoes with me this morning, and if I gave you a guess, I'm sure you would guess on the first try that these are little Anna's shoes. Anna wears these everywhere, to the beach, in the pool, she wears them when she plays outside, and they've gotten pretty dirty. This is a great example for us because just like Anna gets her shoes dirty, God knows that things are going to get messy in our lives, and he knows that we're going to not always do things the right way. What he wants to see from us is that we ask for forgiveness and say, I'm sorry. And in those moments, God honors that, and he says, I forgive you, and then we can try and do things right the next time. Now, if I were to ask little Anna to put these shoes on, but to make sure that she never got them dirty, do you think that would be right? No. And that's exactly how God is with us. He doesn't expect us to be perfect. He knows that we're going to mess up and sometimes things are going to get a little messy, but that that's okay. And he wants to see our heart. He wants to see that we recognize when we do things wrong and we ask for forgiveness. Maybe in the moments when we're not nice to our friends or to our siblings or our parents, those are the moments that we can ask God for forgiveness and say, I'm sorry, God, I'm going to try and do things better the next time. And that's all that God wants to see from us. We hope that you take that lesson into your week this week as you're at school or doing school at home uh, with your families and with your friends, that you know that God honors the moments when you ask for forgiveness when we don't do things right the first time. We miss seeing all of you, and we'll see you again back here next week. Bye-bye. Join me now as we come before the Lord in prayer. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid. In humility and in hope, we come before you in this moment of prayer. You alone are the founding force of all that is and of all that will be. You alone are the saving grace who gives life meaning and joy. And so to you alone, we bring the deepest desires and hurts and needs of our lives. We know that there are many who today face challenges that are beyond anything we personally have ever known. For the hungry who may not ever get enough food, for the enslaved who may not ever enjoy freedom, for the diseased who may not ever experience healing, for the poor who may not ever know of abundance, we pray. Surely by your power, even they can be blessed with the knowledge of your love and with joy in their lives, and we ask that you would grant them these things. Even more, we ask that you would so move in the hearts of those who can help that such human suffering would decrease and then come to an end. We also know, good Father, of needs within our own community that will not be met without your healing touch. We need you to stir us from our complacency and move us toward action. We need you to give us courage to speak healing words to those whom we've hurt or those who have been hurt by others. 
We need you to help us find a way to overcome the hatred and division that we so easily embrace for those who are different or those with whom we might disagree. We need you to ease the fear and confusion that is in our own hearts as we stumble our way through uncertain times. We need you to continue to seek us out and to welcome us as we dare to invite you and your life-changing presence ever deeper into our hearts and into our lives as we grow and then overflow with gracious love into our often loveless world. O oh God, each of us has at least one thing on our minds right now that we cannot shake, one thing for which we most need your intervention, and we name it and speak it to you now. Touch us where we most need it today, and then lead us in the next steps of our journey of life with you. Thank you, Lord, for listening. Thank you for answering. And thank you for your presence with us and your Son as we pray together in the words that so long ago he taught all of us to say. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Every day we go to war again we assume know so much more than them before we hear what they have to say headline breaks we start to hate again calling them names again we give our peace away I hope they see I want to see it. I hope we believe it. I want to see, I want to see the love all around you, all around you. I want to know, I want to know.
Let us begin our time in the scriptures with a prayer for illumination. Please join me in prayer. Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. A reading from the book of 1 Samuel. Samuel said to Saul, You have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. The Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever, but now your kingdom will not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart, and the Lord has appointed him to be ruler over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. And Samuel left and went on his way from Gilgal. The rest of the people followed Saul to join the army. They went up from Gilgal toward Gilbeah of Benjamin. Saul counted the people who were present with him, about 600 men. And now, a reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Paul stood up and with a gesture began to speak. You Israelites and other who fear God, listen. The God of this people Israel chose our ancestors and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with uplifted arm, he led them out of it. For about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. After he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance for about 450 years. After that, he gave them judges until the time of the prophet Samuel. Then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul, son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, who reigned for 40 years. When he had removed him, he made David their king. In his testimony about him, he said, I have found David, son of Jesse, to be a man after my heart, who will carry out all my wishes. Of this man's posterity, God has brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus, as he promised. The Word of the Lord. Oh 
Friends, will you join me in prayer? Lord, may the words of my mouth and meditations and thoughts of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. For it is in Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. These are quite anxious times. They've been described as unprecedented and quite challenging. As many of you know, I've been gathering a virtual community through Facebook Live and by Zoom every single day, Sunday through Saturday at 5.30 in the morning for about 30 minutes since March 16th, around the time of the shelter-in-place directives here in the state of California during this COVID-19 coronavirus. This virtual community has been gathering to lift up prayers with and for one another and for the world around us. Many of you have, have offered those prayers, have let me know of prayers, and we've added that in the list. We also gather to hear and to read scripture together. And every single day I am humbled as this virtual community pours out prayers, prayers of thanksgiving for the many ways that God shows forth God's love in the midst of great challenges and great anxiety. And I'm also equally astounded by the fact of so many prayers, so many prayers of personal prayers, those of neighbors and strangers, and the fervency of God's people all around the world as we lift up prayers for you, for the church, for the church's witness in every place, to be faithful during these times. The prayer list that I have that has been added every single day is five pages long and counting. And 30 minutes is not an adequate time because in the midst of the anxieties and stresses of life, the deep challenges, whether it be of COVID, whether it be of, of households, of, of students that are struggling, people who are sick, people who have lost loved ones, every single moment of the day, we are in need of God's mercy and grace. We are in need of knowing that God's love abides that God's love is unfailing and unending. The great 20th century theologian Paul Tillich had described three universal sources of anxiety that every single human being faces. Number one, the anxiety of, of our fate and of death. Where will we go? How will I die? Where will I go when I die? Number two, of emptiness, of the loss of meaning. And number three, guilt and condemnation. Perhaps you and I experience a combination of those. Every human being wonders about some of those three or all of those three. Where will we go when we die? Um, what is the purpose of why I'm here? And the anxiety of the meaning of life. Then number three, the guilt that I have. I need to know that I'm forgiven. I need to know that the, my past shame, my present shame, those things that I wished that I did or that I could do over again, those regrets, Paul Tillich was right in so many respects. And we oftentimes, when we are ridden with those anxieties, those stresses, those challenges, we make wrong decisions. We are creatures who are limited. We are fearful. In the midst of anxiety, stresses, and challenges, we can sometimes make unwise decisions, wrong decisions, because we want to resolve things quickly. We don't want to wait. We don't want to wait upon the hand of God, because sometimes we might be wondering and waiting, God, when will you answer? Let me act before you do, even though I may know better. We confront that in our text today. In the Old Testament text that was read to us in Samuel, Samuel, as we know, is a faithful priest and a faithful prophet. Samuel, as I invite you to read earlier in these chapters, is one who we encounter is birthed 
after the fervent and ardent prayers of his mother Hannah and his father Elkanah. Elkanah and Hannah, who are advanced in their years, are, are praying to God and going to the temple. And they're counseled by the priest Eli. Elkanah's household is contrasted to Eli's household. Elkanah and Hannah are very dependent upon God. Their hearts beat after the heart of God. Are they anxious? Yes. But their, anx their anxiety of whether they'll have a child is, is consoled and comforted by what they know of God, of God's love, that God will hear their prayers. Contrasted to Eli, the priest, who should know better. And we read in those earlier chapters in 1 Samuel that Eli and his sons are greedy. Eli, the priest who should know better, is bent on serving either himself or his sons over and against God's priorities and, and God's agenda. And we read that God will deal with Eli and his sons and the entire household of Eli because God is looking to Samuel and to Elkanah. Samuel's heart, when he's born, his heart beats after the heart of God. He is one who loves God, who knows of God's counsels, of God's commandments, and comports himself in that way. And so when it's time to name the first king of the monarchy of Israel, God calls upon Samuel to tap Saul, to anoint Saul, to let Saul know that, Saul, you're going to be chosen. You're going to be anointed by God. And Samuel is there as a faithful priest, as a faithful prophet to guide Sam, uh, to guide Saul, that is, to guide Saul in the ways of God, to not only select him and elect him, to let him know that your power and authority, Saul, comes from God, but here's how you are to rule. And so, one of the first instructions that, that Samuel gives to Saul in chapter 10, verse 8 of 1 Samuel is, quote, And you shall go down to Gilgal ahead of me. Then I will come down to you to present burnt offerings and offer sacrifices of well-being. Seven days you shall wait until I come to you and show you what you shall do. Very clear. Samuel tells Saul, you'll go to Gilgal. And wait for me there. Wait for me there for not five days, not six days, but seven days, so that I could then give you further instructions. And so in the chapter for our text today, the context is that Saul summons 3,000 Israelites to go with him. 2,000 stay with him, and 1,000 are with his son Jonathan as they battle the Philistines. So the 2,000 that are with Saul are ready to battle the Philistines. And we read later, um, earlier in this chapter, chapter 13, that Saul has a decisive battle against the Philistines. And because of that, understandably, the Philistines are really mad. And it says there in verse 5 of chapter 13 that the Philistines muster, they muster up the strength to fight Israel. They summon 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen, and troops like the sand on the seashore in multitude. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of warriors. They're ready, the Philistines are, to fight and to avenge the earlier defeat. The Israelites discover this, hear about this, and the text says that they are in distress. They are in distress, for the troops were hard-pressed. Those 3,000 or those 2,000 who were with, with Saul, they already fought a, a battle. And now to confront thousands of chariots and thousands of additional infantrymen, it's understandable then that the Israelites, the text says, the people hid themselves in caves and in holes and in rocks and in tombs and in cisterns, wherever they could go to hide to protect themselves, we get the sense that they're so fearful. 
And King Saul, what does he do? Finding that he's pressed on every side, finding the text says that the people are scattering. He can't control them. And so he goes to what he thinks should be done. He presents a burnt offering. And so when Samuel finally comes, Samuel wants to hear of what has transpired in the in-between. And Saul shares the report. He says, When I saw that the people were slipping away from me and that you did not come within the days appointed and that the Philistines were mustering at Michmash, I said, Now the Philistines will come down upon me at Gilgal, and I have not entreated the favor of the Lord. So I forced myself and offered the burnt offering. King Saul, in his anxiety, in his distress, in his anxiety of fate and death and and fear of loss and what is the point if we're about to die and what happens if I don't gain the favor of God, if I don't entreat the favor of the Lord to be sure that the Lord is on our side, what does he do? He goes against the explicit instructions of Samuel and proceeds to present a burnt offering to the Lord. He disobeys Samuel's instructions and by extension disobeys the very instruction of the Lord. God knows the heart of Saul. For when given the right conditions, Saul will do things his own way. And so that's the way that his reign as king continues again and again. Evidence after example after example. Saul will show his true character and colors. He's bent on doing things his own way. When he thinks what should be done, when pressed on every side, his anxious heart doesn't follow the ways of God. See, the calling is clear in, se- in this text and in every text in Scripture that loving God means following God. Loving God means following what God says because what God says comes from the heart of God. There's many synonyms in Scripture that talk about what God says. They're called commandments, They're called testimonies, ordinances. All of those are synonyms, instructions. All of those are synonyms. What God says, what he desires, comes from his heart because he knows what's best. And God surely knows what's best for God's people and their leader. And that's why God instructs Saul through Samuel's word. So we know what the call is. Saul knew what what the call is. Love God. Because when you love God, you'll love God's people and you'll care for them the way that God wants you to care for them. See, it's not about, yes, the people are scared, the people are, are scattering, but trust in God that God will speak to their hearts. Trust in God's heart, even as the outward evidence looks like something else. Don't lean on your, own, on your own understanding, people of God. Don't lean on your own what you could see because God sees the heart of, of people. Trust in God. Trust in God's love for God's people. Care for God's people in the way that God wants you to. Follow God's heart. Follow God's ways for that's what it means to have the heart after God. But we have a heart issue, don't we? We have a heart issue, just as Saul did. We have a heart issue because when we are confronted with the right conditions, that which brings anxiety and stress and challenge, we wonder too. We get fearful. We get impatient. We want to do things our way. It's like when I was a kid and one day in the shopping mall and My mom told me to stay put, to just stand right outside the store because she knows it has a little boy. I didn't want to go into the 
into the uh, into the women's boutique store where she you know will check out clothes and try it on and, and be there for 30 minutes an hour hour and a half and so she said okay stand right here and don't leave don't leave well within 10 minutes what do I do I start to wander off I wander off and that's what I did I walked away trying to look for her and my wandering around the store, I couldn't find her. I think she was in the changing room. So I went outside to the bigger mall and just kept wandering, thinking, okay, she's not in the store, she must be in the mall. Walked around, walked around and started to cry. And when she finally found me, she said, why did you leave? I told you to just stay right here. Well, we as human beings are like that, aren't we? Whether we're little children or grown-up children, we walk away from what we have been told by God who, who knows our hearts inside and out, who knows us best. And that's what is happening here. Tillich is right in saying that we are anxious about where we go when we die. We're anxious about the, the meaning of life. We're anxious about guilt and shame and not, and not being embarrassed. All of those things, all of those anxieties. But yet we make wrong decisions when we're pressed on every side. And that's where we need the gospel. We need the good news of God in Jesus Christ. And that's what the Apostle Paul in the New Testament, and that's what the Old Testament points to. And what the New Testament in the Acts of the Apostles says, as the Apostle Paul and the disciples were, were right there and he and his companions, it says in Acts chapter 13, they were in Perga and Pamphylia, and they were invited to share a word of exhortation to the people. And what does he proceed to say? He proceeds to recount in a very summary way, here is what the God of our ancestors has done. He recounts about um, God uh, delivering God's people from the land of Egypt. He shares about how he walked with them, accompanied them through the wilderness. He speaks about the hundreds of years that God accompanied them and sojourned with them. He speaks about how he, through the prophet and priest Samuel, he called Saul and finding that Saul was a, was a man whose heart wasn't after the heart of God, he called David and from the line of David to Jesus the Savior. Why does the Apostle Paul do that? Why does he exhort God's people and the wider community with that history? It's because he wants to remind the gathered community that the God who is revealed in Jesus Christ is the God who's not some abstract thought or who is some some uh, figment of the imagination or is um, some just a, a, um, a, a person in a story or a, the main character in some nice piece of literature. But this is the God who enters into our history, into the challenge that human beings face every single day, whether it be thousands of years ago or whether it be last year or whether it be just yesterday or maybe even earlier today. This is the God in Jesus Christ who walks with you and me and with all of God's people in every time and in every place. And it is in the person of Jesus Christ who is so much better than past prophets, past kings, and past priests. He is prophet, priest, and king all in one. Just as prior priests like Samuel who pray with and for God's people, Jesus, our Lord and Savior, is an even better priest because he is the one who not only prays with us, he prays for us forever. He is prophet because he, just like other prophets, declares and shares the word of God. But he's an even better prophet because Jesus Christ teaches and shares the word of God's love, what God's love is about, because he himself is the living word. Remember John 1.1? 1, 1? He is the word 
made flesh. So he is the one who declares the word of love, for he himself is that word. He is the one who gives his very life as a visible demonstration of what the word is about. The word of love. The word that forgives. The word that says to all of our anxieties, that this is where you'll go when you die. You will be with me. This is how you deal with of meaninglessness. The meaning of life is about following my life. This is how you deal with your guilt, embarrassment, condemnation, shame, all of that. Because I find you worthy. I love you. That's God's decisive word in Jesus Christ. And he's king. He's prophet, he's priest, and he's king. He's greater than Saul. He's greater than David. Because Jesus Christ is victorious. That's what a king is. A faithful, powerful king is victorious over all forces, all principalities, anything and anything and anyone that would try to vanquish God's love. Jesus Christ conquered it by his life, by his death, by his resurrection, by his ongoing work. Jesus Christ is victorious over sin, death, and evil even though outward evidence says otherwise. Even though we may feel defeated, we may feel like the outward challenges and anxieties in our head, in our heart, in our bodies, in the world around us say otherwise. The good news declares decisively that Jesus Christ is prophet. Jesus Christ is priest. Jesus Christ is king like no other. He speaks to our lives. He speaks to the world like no one else can. You know, the great 16th century uh, reformer, the founder of Calvinism, the founder of our reformed tradition and Presbyterianism, John Calvin. John Calvin had a family crest, a family crest. And it's pictured with two hands cut with a heart on it. And the heart says these words in Latin, cor meum tibi afro domine prompte et sincere, or my heart I offer to you, Lord, promptly and sincerely. Let me repeat that. My heart I offer to you, Lord, promptly and sincerely. John Calvin and the other reformers really captured in just that one phrase what life is about, what the gospel is about, why we are here. Following Jesus is about loving God and loving God's people. Love is what it's all about. To love God and to love people as Christ loves people. He demonstrates what that love looks like. He gives his very life. He listens to their hearts cry. He accompanies them on life's journey. No matter who they are, he washes his disciples' feet. He forgives his enemies. He calms the storms. That's what loving people looks like. In 2011, Pastor Jeff Chapman shared these responses from young children about their responses of what they thought love looks like. There's eight-year-old Rebecca who said that when my grandmother got arthritis, she couldn't bend over and paint her toenails anymore. So my grandfather does it for her all the time, even when his hands got arthritis too. There's Bobby, age seven, who said, love is what's in the room with you at Christmas if you stop opening presents and listen. There's Tommy, age six, who answered, 
Love is like a little old woman and a little old man who are still friends, even after they know each other so well. There's seven-year-old Chris who said, Love is when mommy sees daddy smelly and sweaty and still says he is handsomer than Brad Pitt. There's Nick, age seven, who said, Love is when you tell a guy you like his shirt and then he wears it every day. There's Carl, age five, who said, Love is when a girl puts on perfume and a boy puts on shaving cologne and they go out and smell each other. What does love look like in your life and in mine? In our homes, in our communities, in the church, in the world. This world where there is so much division, so much hatred and violence, so much pain, so much anxiety, so much stress. Let's we as people of God who are loved by God share the love and life of Jesus Christ with everyone that we meet so that the world may know of God's love and of the God of love. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God, you are love. God, you are the God of love and we thank you. We thank you that you show us what love is in Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior. Help us, O oh God, to love as you loved us, offering ourselves, sharing our life with others, that we might lean upon your love, your love that is steadfast, that is unfailing and unending. For we pray these things in Jesus' name and all God's people say, Amen. Friends, we have heard the word of God read and proclaimed. And so now let's affirm our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Just as we learn that John Calvin, as his family crest said, my heart I offer to you, Lord, promptly and sincerely. Might that be our pledge, our commitment as followers of Jesus Christ and as a congregation? We, Lord, offer to you our heart promptly and sincerely. Might you and I do that today, this week, and all of our lives to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God. Those are tangible ways that we offer our hearts to the Lord. And so, sisters and brothers in Christ, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace both now and always. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, thanks be to God. Amen.